What's up guys and welcome back to Moan Inc. If you guys are new here, then hello. My name is Erica and it is an absolute pleasure to have you joining me today on the channel because for today's video, as you can see from the title, I am chatting to Stephanie Black. Now you guys may recognize Steph because she has given us such fun and engaging short form content over on TikTok and Instagram, all about ancient history and archeology. span I would mention her usernames, however, they do change cross platform. And so therefore, if you want to see some of Steph's super famous short form content, you guys can find all of the links to her profiles in the description below. Steph has accumulated millions upon millions of views cross platforms. I mean, her reach is absolutely insane. And she's been inspiring people on social media to get into this field. And obviously as we discussed before, and you guys know who watch this channel, that is something that I am incredibly passionate about myself. So I invited Steph on to talk about that, but also to talk about her own academic journey, her own academic research, and her own academic passions when it comes to archeology, span because Steph is currently getting her PhD from Durham University here in the UK, despite being from Australia. So we can also discuss what that move was like. But before we get into all of that, Steph, the way that I start my interviews is by having you update us on the context that we would need to understand how young little Steph over in Australia discovers archeology span and how she ends up deciding that this is a track she wants to take, not knowing obviously that she's gonna be internet famous <laughs> one day. So can you, first of all, take us back to young Steph and how it is that you discovered archeology span and got into the field itself? I would say I became aware of archeology span when I was seven and I read um, a book series called Cairo Gym and I plug it in every interview because I think more people should have read it. I'm pretty sure it's an Australian series it's about this guy and he lives in Egypt in the Valley of the Hairdressers and he goes on all these adventures. I don't know. It made sense to a seven-year-old is all I'm saying, which isn't saying much. Kids' books are wild. Um, and then I remember very distinctly at 10 being like, I want to be an archaeologist, but I didn't understand what an archaeologist was. I just think I knew it was someone that went on adventures. It was someone who traveled and that was what I wanted to do. And then when I went to like was looking at options for university and I was 17 and my mom was like, you need to figure out what you want to do in life. You need some plan. And I was 17. I was like, how dare you suggest that I have plans for my future? You hate me. I was literally on my laptop looking at courses at a local university. And I thought about doing ancient history, but it involved learning a language and I am not a languages person. And then I saw that they were offering for the first time um, a bachelor's of archeology. span And I went, I didn't know you could be an archaeologist. I wanted to be an archaeologist when I was 10. All right, I'll do archaeology. And that was as much thought as went into it. <laughs> no way. So that must have been then like one such a shock to your family, but also like a shock to you when you showed up and you're like, this is now what we're doing. Yeah, no, very much. I think I I think I'd literally, in my mind, I don't know if this is exactly the the, the scene of events. My mum had asked me you know, had tried to do a nice sit down conversation and I'd stormed off being, how dare you? And I'd gone to my laptop and it was just there. And I it came out like in my mind, 20 minutes later going, so yeah, I'm going to study archeology span at university. Just like walked out, was like, this is what's happening. And I chose my major of anthropology because the point was um, of the degree was to combine together the arts and the sciences. So archeology span was under history, which was arts. And we had to pick a science and I am not a sciencey person at all. And they were all the science options for the major were done in alphabetical order. At the time I was watching the TV show Bones and obviously A for anthropology was top of the list. And so I got there and I, I think it was like, you know, accounting, anthropology. And I went, well, Bones is an anthropologist. So I guess that'll be my major. No way. That was literally as far. And here's the thing, like the anthropology I did wasn't even the anthropology of bones. It was social <laughs> cultural anthropology. And I loved it. I love anthropology. It was so much fun. Um, but yeah, like, so, so I always get questions like, oh, like, you know, what thought, like, what did you do before applying? What did you study? How did you like make the best application? I'm like, I 
just when I'll apply for this. Like I put no thought, no effort into it at all. So then what was it like then getting to university and actually studying this? Like not having, again, like the background, the, I mean, foundations outside of, you know, really Mm. wanting to do it when you were a kid and then moving into like, okay, this is now a reality. How was that adjustment for you? I think in some ways, I think the adjustment was easy because I grew up homeschooled. So I say, I feel like the education changed, like didn't change. In the only thing I'd say that changed was actually going to university because I'd spent basically the entirety of my high school career. I would watch like DVDs of like teachers who were teaching and then I'd do the work, which is kind of what going to lectures is. You just go to the lecture and then you go off and do the work. So I kind of had that foundational in independent learning, but I always say it was kind of odd, the archaeology, in that I feel no one really knew what it was about because it was the first time that this course had been offered. No one, like, and it is very different, I feel, learning archaeology in, like, Australia versus in America and in the UK because, obviously, in America you have to write, like, essays, to, like, get into university. It's quite competitive. In Australia you just click, I want to apply for a unit. Like, there isn't too much background. Um... So I think coming in knowing literally nothing and not having anyone to ask for feedback, it was stressful because I had to figure out my career trajectory completely on my own. But at the same time, it gave me a lot of freedom. So I you know, I didn't feel as constrained, like, oh, this is the path I have to take. But I do say, like, it felt not too much about archaeology. It was a lot more ancient history. I technically have a minor in ancient Roman history because I did three units on it for fun. Um And it was a lot more cultural anthropology, which no one, I think, in high school in Australia is learning anthropology. So we were all coming in at like, you know, knowing nothing. So then that must have kind of been a bit of a superpower being homeschooled and then going into university, because at least like when I went to university, Mm. lots of people around me were struggling and they would say, you know, like, gosh, this is so much more like on your own. I wasn't really expecting this. But Mm. I had come off the back end of, I went to rehab at 16. So I did a lot of independent schooling. Like I couldn't go into school a lot. So when I went to university, I was ready for that. And I was confused as to how everybody else was like struggling with that. But then I realized like, oh, I went through a very unique thing, which Mm. even though obviously you didn't do rehab, it's still that idea of you had that background in independent learning. Yeah. No, I remember being really confused because I was like, you know, you've all done Australia's equivalent of the A-levels, the HSC. I was like, you know, haven't you guys had to do your own, in like, you know, you, you've done a major exams, like surely you know how to study, but people were like, no, like even up until sometimes some of the end points, they were still getting very explicit thesis statements when that was like learning how to write an essay. That was something I'd kind of spent my whole high school I'd done a lot of literature analysis that was kind of the basis of my education so I was very comfortable in kind of the creative writing space like I remember one of our essays I was really panicked about the essays because I knew it was quite different like I'd never done referencing before going to university so that was something that I had to learn um but we had to write a prosopographical essay on a guy and then for extra credit it was to write his tombstone in it was he was an ancient Roman I really liked that. I was super, I was like, oh, this 250 words for a few extra points, you know, like, you know, so-and-so brought honor to his family. He fought bravely in his battle. Like, I was like, oh, this is easy. Like, that sounds like fun. That. It was so fun. Like, I like those little, like, if I, if I ever get the opportunity to do that kind of stuff, I, you know, organize my own um, assignments. I want to kind of include that. But it was interesting to see how many people were panicking about this creative writing aspect. They were like, I'm totally comfortable with the essay writing creative writing absolutely not I was like oh no I've got the creative writing but how do I write a thousand word essay how do I reference like so I just think it's it's different like everyone comes to universities with different strengths and different weaknesses you just need to figure out what those are and then obviously work on your weaknesses absolutely so you go through your undergrad and clearly something clicks right there's like a synergy that makes you go okay I have to continue studying this So what was that that really spoke to you during those years that you were like, I'm not done with this subject just yet? I think, I I always say maybe the first time I ever did any archaeology, which was going to Italy and doing pottery analysis. So it wasn't like I was excavating. We were just sat 
in the visitor center for the archaeological sites, uh, sorting pottery and drawing it very meticulously. I am, I hate sigillata italica now. I can't look at it. Literally the last thing I drew, like the teacher had to rub it out and like redraw it. And she was like, this is how you do it. I was like, this is the last one. I'm never doing this again. <laughs> I don't want to look like, I don't care. But being on an archaeological site that wasn't, it wasn't like the big ones. Like I had previously done like one trip to Europe. I'd been to Rome, you know, I'd been to Venice. You know, I'd done all the big sites, but I'd done the big places. But to be on an archaeological site in the off season, um, when there's no one else around, I felt it's like it was almost a spiritual experience just to sit there and like, you know, sit on the steps of a Roman temple in a Roman forum eating my lunch just for shits and giggles and there's no one else around was just it was a beautiful experience I think and I kind of went this is right and I'm someone that when I make a decision I commit to it so I was like okay I'm going to study archaeology I'm going to take the opportunities I'm going to try and make myself as employable as possible by doing lots of different things and so by doing that I experienced so much of archaeology and I saw its potential that it isn't just digging in the ground it's there's so much more to it so it is kind of this like oh god I don't want to use this word but it's the only one that's coming to me like a grounding sort of like actually mm -hmm. realizing that there are these things that you can encounter and that you can see and visualize and not just read about am I right in sort of taking that from it yeah like because in Australia at least when I was doing my degree there weren't any opportunities to do field work in Australia because so much of it's indigenous there's a lot of protections like even uh, commercial archaeology in Australia if it deals with indigenous stuff it's much more focused on survey there's little excavation unless it's kind of the colonial stuff um so I'd never like seen an archaeological site I'd never been on one before so it's like in some ways I had no frame of reference but I didn't have any preconceived notions of what archaeology should be or could be. Um, so I guess in some ways there was a level of innocence to it and, and a lot of naivete. I was very, very naive going into it. But that isn't necessarily a bad thing. I was about to say, like, I've spoken to a lot of people, like, for my channel, obviously, mm -hmm. who, who all say that there was a level of naivety, whether it be setting up their accounts or going into the subject or you know at any point throughout the career that mm. led us to sitting down and having a conversation there's always an ignorance or naivety in there that they're like I genuinely didn't know what I was really signing up for or what I was doing or how this ended up being so mm. successful so I think that is a really important note that you don't have to have everything like figured out because that naivety leads you to great things as well mm. And I think also leaving yourself open to opportunities because I definitely panicked in my first year because everyone um, in my cohort, it seems, so because in Australia, we start our academic year um, at the beginning of the calendar year. So we get to our mid-year break, which is the winter break um, around June, July. And like we came back after that and I was like, oh, in my second year, I'll do field work. And it seemed absolutely everyone had been on field work in Israel. They'd done the dig that the university was organizing because they were Egyptologists. And because it was right after the Arab Spring, they weren't letting, the university wasn't letting undergrads go to Egypt. So anyone that was interested in Egypt went to Israel and that was the majority of the cohort. And I remember coming back being like, wait, you you guys have, have been on a dig already? Like we're only first years, what, what's going on? And it made me panic. I was like, oh no, I'm going to be behind everyone else. So that's what really pushed me to, I did, just while I was in uni, I did the pottery analysis in Italy. I then went and studied bones in Poland. That was the first time I excavated. I dug bones. And then I went and did like, what was it? It's like landscape archaeology in Bulgaria. And this is because people always ask me, oh, do you have any advice for people at university? And I say, make sure people in your department know who you are. Because that's how I got to Bulgaria. Because I had one lecturer in second year who was like, hey, if people want to help me by looking at burial mounds on Google Earth, hit me up. So I did. I spent a year, you know, on Google Earth, which is funnily enough, basically what I'm doing for my PhD. So, you know, skills, you learn different <laughs> skills. But there was the opportunity to go to Poland because she was going to ground truth her data. And she was like, do you want to come? And I went, okay, sure. That sounds like, amazing though. Hold on, unpack that for me. So how long were you there? What was like your day like? 
the whole oh, shebang. Bulgaria was insane. I love Bulgaria, don't get me wrong, but we were very remote. If anyone watching this is Bulgarian or knows Bulgaria, we were in Yambol or we were just outside of Yambol. And to give a reference, it's when we told the hotel clerk in, in Sofia where we were going because we were specifically told, don't tell people you're an archaeologist. Tell them that you're studying old maps. Oh, yeah, it's a big thing when you travel to do field work to not tell people you're an archaeologist because a lot of people just assume that you're a treasure hunter. And I can't remember the guy's mm. name, but apparently one of the biggest um, Bulgarian archaeologists was a man who used to get basically giant, like, tractors and just drive them through burial mounds to get the treasure. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah, there is so much to unpack. Anyway, so much to unpack in that. So, yeah, we were told, don't tell anyone. So, And we look so suspicious because, you know, none of us are professional liars. So like, the hotel clerk's like, oh, so wh- where are you planning on going? And we're like, oh, we're going to go to Yambol. And, like, you could see the look on the clerk's face. I was like, why are you going there for, like, a month? <laughs> because there's nothing there. We were in, you know, a tiny local rural village. Like, you know, why Why would, you know, four students from Australia be spending a month here? There's no reason. To, well, there was a very good reason, but we just couldn't tell anyone. <laughs> yeah. So with all of that, then, what would you say is is the part of this whole subject that really, like, excites you? Like, is it working in the field? Is it a storytelling aspect to everything of, like, histo- like the historical sort of storytelling is what mm. I mean? Is it, you know, the research side of things that is more so exciting? Like, what is it for you that's like a... I think it's the mystery and it's feeling like a detective because you... It's, it is a lot of guesswork and archaeologists will be like, oh, no, it, it's it's analysis, it's study, we're doing the research. And I'm like, yeah, but it also is guesswork so unless you've got a time machine, you're never going to know 100%. Like, it's good, it's evidence-based guesswork, you know. If you've got a pot that looks like a cup we're going to assume it's it held a liquid of some kind you know it's not totally crazy theories but I think it's it's definitely it's the mystery of it and it's the unknown and it's the adventure because you feel like an you do feel like an adventure you know going out to like the middle of the desert I it's not even I'd have to say Dubai because no one ever knows where I dug in the UAE so I just say Dubai um and literally wiping the sands away and there's like 12, 3,000 year old arrowheads just lying in the sand. Like that's so exciting. And to be the first person to see an object after so much time, and not even that, you don't know, have to be thousands of years, it can be hundreds, it can be 20 years. But that moment where you realize that it's like those degrees of separation, the whole Kevin Bacon thing. Um, you in that moment before you've called anyone else over there's one degree of separation between you and the last person that saw it and that's that object and so you are I you know I don't know who that person is but in some ways I'm part of their story or their story continues through what I do because even though you know maybe it's just a shell that's it it's a shell in the middle of the desert but who brought that shell there why was that shell brought there why wasn't it decorated because in the UAE they were decorating shells why was it only smooth is there something wrong with the shell and so I'm now a part of that story which I think is beautiful that is such a beautiful way of looking at it I've never heard that before and I love that (laughs) yeah I feel like in some ways this idea is again I would say when I finished my undergrad maybe I would have had a very different answer and I think from doing social media and realizing how much of a storytelling element there is to archaeology because I feel like when you're in academia, it's such like this is an academic discipline, we're studying this. And that's great. Like, obviously, it is an academic discipline. That there is a value in studying it in that way. But we are storytellers. We're telling the stories of people who can't anymore. You know, I, for what I'm doing my PhD, there's no written language. So hopefully I do them justice. You know, I get to t- say what was happening 3,000 years ago. So you mentioned there you're getting your PhD, but also you are so popular on TikTok, mm-hmm. Instagram. So I want to know, because I'm so nosy, with all this studying that's going on, your incredible digs, like the travels that you're doing, what was the catalyst that got you onto TikTok and Instagram that sort of made you go, you know what, I'm going to share this? Because I know you have other accounts as well, but specifically mm. with the archaeology, like what made you want to share that? I think it came from a from an area of just sharing what I loved 
um, you know, I, if it's my own account, I'm going to talk about what I'm interested in. I'm interested in archaeology. And so I think I just fell into it because I started my TikTok before COVID. I'm one of the few people that was in there pre-COVID, but I started it just for fun. Um, it was because I was living in a eight, I can't remember which, how many beds. It was either 17 or 18 bed youth hostel dorm room in Oxford because I was working as a commercial archaeologist at the time and I was saving up my money to afford rent. Um, so I, because I was saving up my money, I couldn't afford to do anything. The only thing I used to do was go to the cinema, actually. I used to go to the cinema a lot. It was fun. It was Fair great. enough. It was That's great. warm in the middle of winter. So yeah, nice. So that was something to do that was inside. Um, but the one thing I had was the phone and the other thing I had was um, Wi-Fi. And I'd room and I'd seen stuff about it was I think it was like it I still thought it was musically and like I looked it up and it was like oh no it's TikTok and I was like okay let's download this app because I like on my weekends I had nothing literally nothing to do and then when my laptop got stolen because I was an idiot and I for, I rushed out to work and I left it in my bed and it got stolen so that was all my images from my travels gone oh, God. except what I'd uploaded to Facebook so I literally only had my phone that was it I, I couldn't even like watch stuff on my laptop because that's what I used to do in the evenings so if you sw- don't do it but if you can scroll back right to the beginning of my account because I've not deleted a video in the over four years I've been doing this I have close to 5,000 videos on my account I've, it's obscene I have an addiction it's fine <laughs> most of the early, all of the early videos are either done in the hostel dorm room on the weekends when no one else was in the room or in the women's bathroom because there were very few women there because it was during winter there wasn't a lot of people so and it was kind of warm so I just be in the bathroom for like hours filming TikToks. Yeah, it sounds so miserable when I say this. Like, yeah, I started it because I had no money and I was just sad. Well, you know, I don't think it sounds miserable at all. In fact, I think that that's a really cute way of going about social media, that it's more about like, I didn't have anything to do, so I might as well go here because there will be Mm -hmm. other people here. Like, it's still a form of not finding something to do, but finding people to share something with. Yeah, that sense of connection which is I think is what I've come to value now about the account is like if I go live it's like the same people are on there and it's really nice to get like updates and people will like be, there's like one girl who would, like we had this whole saga I say we as if I was involved but <laughs> like getting updates about getting into Oxbridge and her applications and then she got she got in but couldn't afford it and then she got funding and so it was this whole like every time I was going live it felt like it was so nice to get those updates and now she's like writing her first essay and I'm just like I'm so excited for you like it feels like I was there which is why you know even though obviously I wasn't but that's something I I really have come to value that sense of community especially as someone who felt kind of alone during my undergrad in studying and because I didn't have anyone else who was doing archaeology or even history um but this kind of yeah the community and not just on TikTok but being able to meet other tiktokers offline um and other people from social media like you like getting to meet you that was so nice it was like oh my gosh these are these are real people behind the the camera which is i think what i've noticed is everyone kind of goes oh whoa like uh it's just i'm so used to you being on my phone now you're like in front of like mm, there's always that adjustment period where you're like oh my gosh yes okay you're a real person you're not Mm. just on my phone (laughs) like literally yeah 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 so you start this account then before lockdown and Mm. then we go through lockdown and you're still updating and then obviously you're still updating as per Mm. regularly now now that we're what how long has it been three years nearly four years four years that's crazy I feel like the time has just disappeared but so that's a long time to be on social media Mm. what would you say is like one thing that you've learned about your style of TikToks that has sort of evolved as you've been on the platform maybe just through Instagram like Mm. how has that changed in that time in your approach to creating or sharing that story I think it's been the fact that I'm interested in stories because I never used to see it that way I was like I'm doing archaeology I dig and it felt like everything was quite in isolation like obviously you're looking like say when you're digging up bodies like you're looking at the remains but I'm not like you're not really thinking about the remains as a person um And then in creating content on social media, that's what I discovered is that I do seek out the emotion. I care about the emotion. And I had this thought, because obviously there's a certain 
quote unquote cringe element to crying online, you know, and this idea of being a woman on social media. And I only recently had this thought. I, I say this, I, I do very little with intentionality. It's only once I look backwards, I'm like, oh, so that's why I'm doing this. And I think a lot of my content is done to kind of fight against an idea of what a woman, a female presenter, a female academic should look like. So during lockdown, a lot of the times I would be doing stuff like my hair would be everywhere, even now, so it's slightly everywhere. I'd be doing stuff in my pajamas, film stuff right before going to bed. This kind of, you know, in, I think at the time I was seeing it as being approachable that, you know, I wasn't this staid academic, you know, in my ivory tower. I was a woman of the people. <laughs> um, but I think there was a, there was a deeper aspect to it, like that I was unconsciously doing this kind of, yeah, I mean, I have worn makeup online, but I'm just not someone that I've never worn makeup. And I kind of had this thought, if I want to be authentic online, I have to be authentic to, to who I am. So yeah, occasionally I'll wear eyeliner, occasionally I'll slap on some eyeshadow. I like it. But if I have a great idea for a video, I'm not going to be like, hold up, I need to go and put on the makeup and then I'll film. I'll just film it in the moment and look horrendous and use skin uh, filtering so I don't need <laughs> foundation. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, how do you have such great skin? I'm like, guys, I save my skin by putting that filter on, you know, smooth smooth skinning on TikTok so then I don't need to worry about foundation. It's all good. <laughs> I look much worse in real life. <laughs> but, you know, you say that as if it's, like, easy, though, like, being authentic to yourself, and that's, like, you should take mm. more pride in that. That's not an easy thing to do. Like, there is an element of people who, not that they're going to overthink it, but it is just kind of like this, oh, well, this works and I'm going to do this mm-hmm. and I want to appear this way. And yeah. and the word authentic kind of gets like, you know, morphed and mm-hmm. warped into different things. But you, as you were saying, you know, like you're uploading videos in your PJs and like really just showing people who you are. So is it that you never thought about necessarily being authentic? Like, cause you were saying, you know, you're doing things kind of at the time before you really thought about them. Were you yeah. just like very self-confident in that way or you didn't realize that you were self-confident in that way? I don't think I realized I was self-confident. I also didn't think anyone was watching my videos. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> like to be honest, like I th- not even in that way, but I think I never took social media seriously. Like I didn't realize that there were other people on social media creating content. I was just like, oh, I, I didn't even start originally talking about archaeology. I mean, I did share a little bit about being an archaeologist because at the time I was working in commercial archaeology but it just kind of naturally happened that I was talking like I know I tried doing the weird dance trends at the beginning I still know how to dance to Kesha's Cannibal I practice that a lot (laughs) um you know like I, I have those little random things but that's not what I'm interested in that's not what excites me and if you're going to be creating content for as long as I have been in you know uploading eight videos a day it has to be in something that you're have an interest in and that is archaeology that is history that's talking about it um but yeah I mean I didn't think I would ever be at this stage where people would be interviewing me about social media that was never an intention in some ways I think I've really and to an extent still do fight against the professionalism like I have shifted my content as my account has gotten bigger as I guess my personal brand has grown. I definitely have. I used to share a lot more about myself on there, which I don't do as much. I sort of try and keep it just to archaeology. Um, and to I because I think that's healthy to create some kind of boundary because it's so easy for it to bleed over and it's so easy for it to affect your life. Like I've had panic attacks about TikTok. I've gone through the ringer with it and I've had to have serious conversations. Like it is just social media. You can just uninstall the app. And so why are you having a panic attack? I was very mean to myself in that scenario. I was kind of like, why? This is ridiculous. Why are you behaving like this? I don't think that's mean. I would argue against that. So that's so healthy of you to be able Mm. to have that standpoint of looking back and going, Mm. okay, hold on a second. You can just uninstall this. Like you don't have to go on. Like that shows that there's like a real healthy brain in there (laughs) alongside like everything else. Like, because lots of people can't do that. You know, lots of people are like, this is it. Like, Un- uninstall you can uninstall like the fact that you're having that thought I think give yourself more credit Steph like that's really okay. good I'll give myself credit for it then thank you you're like really bigging me up here this is doing wonders for my ego 
but no I think it's important I think if if anyone wants to create content on, on social media or even just be a watcher on social media I definitely think you have to be aware that you know there it, it is just an app you can just uninstall it and that's okay it's not the end of the world and that's why I'm someone I'm you know there's a saying you know don't count your chickens before they've hatched I'm very much like that or don't put all your eggs in the same basket like I've had so many people be like oh why don't you quit the PhD and just focus on social media full time and I'm like because social media is my hobby. And I think that's where I fought against this perceived professionalization or maybe what I perceive as professionalization. Because to me, it is just a hobby. Like I'm not earning substantial money from this. This is not a main source of income for me. If it becomes something, sure. Like I'm willing to keep options open. I'm not adverse, obviously, to it becoming something more. But I am doing my PhD because that's kind of my plan A. That's always what's going to be there. And social media, if something happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it doesn't. I get enough enjoyment from it. Like the value of social media for me doesn't come necessarily from it being professional, from contacts, from anything. It comes from, I did drama as a kid that I had someone who wanted to view me went, did you do drama in school? And I went, how did you just tell from your account? And I was like, oh, okay. So it give it gave me an avenue to perform, to be creative. It gives me a way of working out how am I going to present academic information in an accessible way. And I feel like I have created a certain style of video, this sort of, I don't know, emotional, I think um, historical hand coined the term sad girls of archaeology, which I think is that kind of sad girl aesthetic in a way. Um, and so that's been really fun to do, to, to develop my own style. Absolutely. And so then if the PhD is your plan A, then like, what do you want to do with it? Like, have you always wanted to teach? Do you want to be more so like a guest lecturer? Do you want to be a writer? Do you want like a documentarian? Like, what have you kind of like always looked at to be like, that's plan A? I want to dig. I'm such a stereotypical archaeologist. I love digging. I love digging like the physicality of the work being out in the field covered head to toe in dirt or mud. And I say this as someone who I am the first to admit, I'm incredibly lazy with physical labor. My mother, she she loves gardening. She could never get me to work in the garden. She cannot get me to dig a hole at all. Like I just will, I can't do it. I hate it. I hate <laughs> it to death. I can spend hours going around digging holes in our, in fields for archaeology. I, the, the physicality of the work, that's what I love about it. So yes, I think, I mean, maybe at some point I'd like to lecture, but I don't think there's a ton of money in it, to be honest. <laughs> That's like, I would like to do academics, but at the moment, the kind of idea is, is I do want to go to Arabia and like physically dig, physically work. I, What's I like miss- your dream site? My dream site would be somewhere, I think, in Alaula. I think definitely in that area. That's so amazing. There's so much archaeology. I went to a conference this year and there were a bunch of different people who were working out there on like various different projects all around the oasis. And it was just so exciting. I am as someone who is currently not really studying any Saudi archaeology. I find it so fascinating. There's so much there that we don't know. And I'm like, I just want to, I just want to get in there. Just yeah, explore it. That is so cool, Steph. That that's what you want to do and like that that's where you're going like, yeah. like just just because I think and this obviously like isn't hate to mm. anybody but like for all of us who are on social media there's always like a you know there's a group of people that want to be documentarians there's a group of people that want to do whatever it is I love to just talk to people I love getting into people's heads so I'm like any chance I can I can't think of another word and I hate myself saying this digging into somebody's head but like when <laughs> I can like get in there and talk to people that are really fascinated by the history or the topic, mm-hmm. like that excites me. And that's what I want to do with my channel yeah. is just try and like share that with other people. Mm-hmm. Cause it's like, you can't talk to that person. I can, let's all do it together kind of a thing. But mm-hmm. I love that yours is like, yeah, that's all great. But, but the dirt, like that, <laughs> I, I want to go back over there. Like th- again, this is nice. You guys are all great, but leave me alone. Give me a helmet, give me some sunglasses and let's go. Yeah, let me stick my headphones in the ear. You know, let me listen to my music. Let me listen to TikTok audios on repeat. Let me listen to podcasts. Just let me dig in the dirt. And I'm happy as Larry. Do you find it calming? I do. Yeah, I do find it very calming. There is something, I think, I had this idea when I was talking to my therapist about um, 
the amount of disassociation I have and kind of this idea that I disassociate while doing archaeology, like just being able to zone out. And there's nothing, here's the thing, when you do archaeology, yes, it can kind of be stressful. So what you want, you want to do this on a site where there's no rush. I worked on a site that has been dug for many, many years because it is a quarry. So basically the archaeologists go in first to the fields. We'd study the archaeology. The quarry comes in, mines out all the sand I think they want, and then they get turned into wetlands. So they get filled with water, which I think is quite nice. It's a very nice circle of life in a way. Um, and so the fact that there kind of was no rush on this site, all I had to do was dig a section, take a photo, one cut, one fill, nice and easy. It's just you're doing work, but you don't need to think about it. There's no stress. There's no worry. Some sites are very stressful. If you work on an intense um, construction site where there's a very strict deadline and every day they're like, have you finished yet? Have you finished? And you're like, no, we're contracted in for eight weeks. It's going to take us eight weeks. Please. I haven't, I don't do everything in a day. Um, it is incredibly calming. It's just you and someone who lived thousands of years ago. And that's all you need to worry about. That sounds almost like meditation in a sense mm -hmm. and like I say that because okay so I don't have that when I do my work like my work <laughs> is not calming at all but when I used to do circus training because I did that when I was at university mm -hmm. from the age of like 17 till I was 21 like 15 to 20 hours a week oh wow and I was only thinking about that when I was doing it and mm -hmm. that's why I loved it so much because it was, it didn't matter what else was happening. I have mm -hmm. to make sure I'm not going to fall 20 feet. Like that was <laughs> the only yeah, worry like I had. Really major thing that you have to concern about because you're like, I don't want to die. Like yeah. I need to be careful. And that sense of like almost meditation of like, you're just mm -hmm. totally in the moment and you're totally aware of what's going on. And like, that's yeah. it, which I guess is why you're so healthy because mm -hmm. that's a very healthy thing to do as well, to be able to zone out and switch off and, and just kind yeah. of. And, and then you come back to the office and you get rudely awakened with, you have to finish the paperwork. This needs to get done. This hasn't been recorded. You haven't done this right. So th there's a balance there, definitely. But do you yeah. want to like write books or do anything like that in the future of your career? I do. And I say that I never used to want to, but it's kind of come about with having so many, because my specialization is the Iron Age of Southeast Arabia. That's very, very specific. And I've had people ask me, like, when I made videos on the topic, like, oh, do you recommend any books? Do you, is there anything you can recommend? And I'm like, I have searched. And I don't want to say that there's literally nothing, but I have not found a non-academic book on the topic. I haven't even found a children's book. I haven't found a, this is an overview to the Iron Age or the, to the prehistory of Arabia. I've, I mean, maybe there's stuff written in Arabic, potentially, but at least in the English language, I have not found anything in like a public history, public archaeology sphere for it. Everything's academic. Then over on, there's some really good academic books. So I always say, look, if you have access to a university library, ask this book. I do think it's quite good, but it, it is a book that if you if you don't have access to an academic library is 70 pounds on Amazon. Oof. Hello. Academic publishing, am I right? Like that's not accessible. And the whole point of TikTok, and that's what I love, is that it's making archaeology, it's making history accessible. Like, I've learned so much. I follow so many fascinating people that I'm like, yes, tell me about your interests. Tell me about your research topics. Um, but I find at the moment it's difficult for me to share my research because it isn't accessible until maybe I get around to finally, hopefully middle of next year, I'll have something published in academia. And then I can be like, I've published one thing. You can read it. You can have it for free. I'll send it to you. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just, I think, which I think speaks to the inaccessibility of, you know, these industries as a whole, and even just academia as a whole, not even specifically archaeology or my niche. I was going to ask, like, why do you think that is? Or do you think that it's just, is it an area that, because I don't know anything about this yeah. specific niche. So is this an area that's not like widely excavated? So there's not a lot known about it. Is it a case that there's just not high demand for this? Or is it just literally because people don't know this exists? I think it's, um as everything somehow is, it's there's a level of racism going on there and Orientalism. So when you look back to, um there was like an institute set up for like the studies of sort of the Near East region, I think by Churchill, potentially. I, I'm vaguely, I feel, I'm, not, I'm not pulling this out of thin air. I did read this. Um, and it was 
when it was set up, it was like focusing on Israel and Palestine, Jordan, kind of almost looking at Iran, like the Mesopotamia region. Arabia wasn't even considered at all, like the whole Arabian Peninsula. And it kind of comes down to this idea of the focus of Western academics focusing on their own history. What's happening down in Arabia doesn't really, didn't influence the development of Western civilization, really. It, it you know, maybe some of the northern bits of Arabia, sure, because that's where you have, uh, you know, from Saudi, you have the rise of Islam itself. That obviously has an impact, but kind of in the ancient history, there's interactions, but these are small tribes people. There's nothing, there's no major empires here. There's no massive civilizations. There's a little, there's stuff going down in Yemen, but on the whole, not, not as, not as, what, as much as going on in these other regions. So you kind of have a history of this area being ignored and being seen as unchanging, which is a big idea that a lot of early Western academics had, that the desert is seen as unchanging. The Bedouins are out there. They've always been out there doing their stuff and nothing's happened, which is ridiculous. Of course, things have happened there. Things happen everywhere. Stuff doesn't literally stay the same. So that is slowly changing. But it's only been since the 50s that there's been research in done and excavations happening in the region. And those first ones were done in Bahrain by some Danish archaeologists who were basically seeking to find what is essentially the Mesopotamian version of the Garden of Eden, which they did find, um, wow. which is Bahrain, which was known as Dillman back then. That, that's basically what they found, the Garden of Eden. But I remember when I was first telling people I was going to dig in Dubai, people were like, why would you dig there? It's only like 10 years old. It's just influences. And I went, Arabia is one of the first places humans went to after leaving Africa. Like there is tens of thousands of years worth of history here. But because before Islam, it never became an empire. Like it never became a massive civilization. There's kind of limit. There is writing, but it's limited. Um, it's been ignored in favor of the kind of more flashy civilizations. Like, you know, Mesopotamia is so interesting because, you know, you, this is where the empires are coming from. You have, you know, obviously Egypt, you've got pyramids. That's so cool. You've got Greece and Rome. There's, there's so much happening in there. It's very easy because you look at how much those civilizations have been studied and how much we still have yet to know. Like they've been studied so in-depthly. There's so many people re researching and yet, you know, I'm sure if you were to ask any S expert, they'd be like, oh, no, I still don't know tons of things. And it's exactly the same with what we've got. Like, it just hasn't been studied. And so what we are studying now is just the very beginning. It's the very beginning, which is so exciting to kind of be here and studying it. That's what I was going to say. Like, the fact that you get to be at the start of that and to, like, mm -hmm. really be getting into the nitty gritty and be part of that story as well, not only the ancient story, yeah. but also the rediscovery story mm. is such an exciting place to be. No wonder you still want to dig. Like, this <laughs> this makes sense. As a storyteller, this makes sense to me. I'm like, yeah, I see yeah. it now. <laughs> yeah, well, so, like, for my PhD, I'm studying, like, in the simplest terms, I'm looking at 15 Iron Age settlements. These settlements have never been published before. This is the first time they've been discovered. So they're 15 villages, like borderline. I mean, I don't want to, there's an argument whether they become urban centers. I I think they might be leaning towards some level of urbanization. They're, they're, they're quite big. You're looking at each one rough, like approximate is around three hectares in size. And that's just the settlement where the houses are. That's not counting the fields and tombs and any other areas on the periphery. Like this is just where the houses are. And so these are big settlements this is a lot going on but they haven't they see none of these sites have been excavated yet it was just the project i'm my data's from was just a survey it was purely to record so there's so many questions i can't answer until we excavate them until we dig so that's why i'm here like i i want to dig because i want to go to these sites i want to dig i want to be like no i want to know what the function is of all these different structures because i'm just guessing based on floor plans essentially like i don't know and i'm just here like i want to know i want to know <laughs> So is that all you're gunning for then? Like that's, th that's the site. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I've got this whole wadi area, 15 settlements. I'm like, get, get me in there. I want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> get stuck in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So then do you have any digs like coming up that you've already, or like that you have your eye on that you're going to do like as you're studying as well? Or is it more so a case now of just zeroing in on PhD time and getting that done? 
I just am really trying to focus on getting in the PhD. I kind of have this, I, it's probably insane. Anyone who's done a PhD is going to be like, she's insane. But I'm trying to get a rough draft done of my PhD by the end of this academic year. So I can then take paid work in archaeology because a lot of sites they want, like if it's a field school, you know, you're paying for the teachers, you're paying for that kind of stuff. And I'm like, I've worked in commercial archaeology. Not, I don't need to be, it's not that I don't need to be taught anything. It's that I've gone beyond that stage where I kind of need that really in-depth field school experience. I did a lot of field schools, they're great, but I've moved beyond that. Um, I haven't dug since March, 2020 when I went home to Australia. That's the last time I excavated. And as someone who loves the dirt, like I get itchy fingers, like I'm desperate to get in. But I just, doing the PhD, doing academia is so full on. And that's, I just, I just really just want to get my PhD done. Like that, that's my main focus. I'm just like, just get, let me do this. Let me do this. Completely fair. So if mm. there's like a little budding archaeologist let's say let's say one of your fans right who has watched your videos and then was like oh my god another long form interview with Steph like yes comes on and is listening to this and is just like vibing and feeling everything that you're saying and it's like I feel the dream I feel the digging like I want to do this what's the advice that you would give to them would it be to just get stuck in just sign up for something or sign up for a course or read or you know, what is it for that young archaeologist that's watching this? What's the advice that you would give them to get to your point? I would say if you live in the UK, um, see if there's a local, if you're under 18, if there's a local young archaeologist club near you or a yap club, the community stuff, um, and you can often get the opportunity to excavate. Look, I taught nine-year-olds who were in a yap club how to excavate a cemetery in Scotland. Like, it can be done. It's, it, you know, you, you're doing proper archaeology in these groups a lot of the time or look and see if there's any public archaeology around you often towns or villages they'll have their own local group and just getting involved it can be a great opportunity um to volunteer that's the good thing Australia doesn't let you volunteer we've got very strong unions and so it's seen as very bad to let volunteers in which I understand but it's difficult in Australia to get experience if there aren't opportunities to volunteer. So in the UK, that's definitely something that I would recommend doing. And on, honestly, there's like free online courses and stuff often offered by like universities, like on Coursera, like looking at history or archaeology. So I'm like, if you've got an interest and you're not quite sure if you want to commit to an entire degree based on vibes like I did, which might be the smartest thing to based do. Based on vibes. <laughs> yeah, honestly, based being like, yeah, I, you know, based on what you wanted to do at 10 years old with no further thought because you're 17, um, you know, if you want to have some thought behind it, definitely, like, I would recommend maybe doing one of these courses and seeing if it does interest you. Just doing general readings, like, I say Google to your best friend and going onto websites, like, even Google Scholar and being, like, archaeology or seeing if there's, like, introduction there's a lot of sort of basic books that can introduce the basics of archaeology to you essentially um and that just I think helps make it a little bit more accessible yeah and with that being said Steph I'm just aware of the time and I think that's a beautiful place to end off the interview so thank you so much for joining me today I cannot stress how thankful I am that you had time to do this. And I want to make that clear to you guys because writing a PhD is no joke. And there was a brief moment where we didn't know if we would have time to factor this in because Steph has just been doing so much work. So I'm very thankful that we managed to find a little moment, a little two hour session that we could sit down and chit chat um, in order to get a conversation together for my followers. So thank you so much. And obviously, for you guys at home, if you guys want to find all of Steph's accounts, as I said at the start of this video, do check them out in the description below. All of her links are down there. Her content is so fun, as I keep saying. So you guys can follow along with her journey down there, as well as obviously her PhD journey is also being updated on those various different platforms. So thank you guys so much for tuning into this episode of Moan Inc. And we'll be seeing you next time with more videos here on the channel. So I'll be seeing you guys then.